is gonna be a good episode i'm excited <laughs> yeah are we gonna do two hours again we'll see i'm down yeah i, I feel have, like i have more notes written oh really i feel like i have more thoughts about pinkerton than blue i think i do too to some extent yeah Right. Do, do, do. <laughs> I think we could just recycle the intro from the last one. That was one. the plan. Yeah. Well, I, okay. But this, what this way, you get varying levels of how good it is. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you want people to listen to episode two, and the first thing they think is this, this is got worse. worse. Yeah. Well, I still have to do it just for my own. All right. Do you want us to <laughs> join along? <laughs> no. Nah, well, if you want, I don't think I'll join. <laughs> do, 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 do. Hello and welcome to In the Garage, the podcast that's all about Weezer and it's very good. I had an idea for the tagline for this podcast. Ooh, yes, go on. In the Garage, the definitive discussion of the world's best band. Whoa. What about In the Garage, colon, where I feel safe? (laughs) In the Garage, a safe space. I retroactively thought of a name for the first episode. I'd have called it Out of the Blue. Oh, and what's your anteroactive name for this episode? I haven't given that much thought yet. Okay. The Pink Album. (laughs) Out of the Pink. (laughs) I hope everyone listened to and enjoyed our first, I almost said album, but it's it's a kind of album. I mean, like, by making this podcast, we're kind of doing something that's as good as what Weezer did when they made the Blue Album. Definitely. Chaz, thoughts? And and I will introduce you in a second. (laughs) Yeah, thanks. Um, To be honest, I didn't really pay attention to what you said there, (laughs) but I would, to some extent... Agree. We're doing this sarcastically, right? Sure. I forget what I said also, quite (laughs) honestly. I think it's time to move on, though. Our podcast, better or worse than the Blue Album? I mean, it's four times as long, so (laughs) I think we're doing something right here. It's true. And in that case, this, this podcast will be much better than Pinkerton. I'm joined, as always, by the resident Weezer emeritus expert of North America, Chaz. How you doing today, Chaz? I'm good. How are you, Chris? Oh, I'm so good. You're I excited? love Weezer, yeah. the band. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. I thought you were talking about Carl Weezer from Jimmy Neutron. <laughs> and I do want the rest of that croissant. <laughs> <laughs> Over to my left, he's at about 10 o'clock, the resident Weezer neophyte, the disciple. Is that the word we're going with? Yeah, sure. Why not? All right. Do you have a better one in mind? No. Nope. Apprentice? Hmm... Disciple of the Weez. Disciple of all four of the Weezers. Would there be more than four yeah, Weezers they're if pro- we they're include, like, like, Jason Cropper, yeah, Matt, yeah. Mikey? Mm-hmm. There are probably about eight Weezers. Anyways. Something like that. We got Tyler in the house. Tyler, yeah. how you doing today? I'm pretty sleepy and I'm very good. How are you, Chris? Thank you for asking again. I'm doing really well. That's great. Just had my coffee and I'm ready to go. You know, we were talking about this off mic. Can you ask for a single double? Chaz, your thoughts? Well, I mean, they'd probably, like, have to clarify if you wanted, like, a single cream or the single sugar. And what would you interpret it as? Because I think there's an obvious answer. Mm. If I said, if I said, could I have a single double and refuse to provide more context, what would you say? I would say one cream, two sugar. That's, I agree. Because, Tyler? No, well, tell me why. Well, I want to hear Tyler's response first. To be honest, I was thinking two cream. Okay. Because... Don't Tim Hortons, they don't have like little like Starbucks stalls where you like turn away and finish the drink, right? No, they no, just get they, it for you. Okay. For they those of you service. from outside of Canada and the northern United States, Tim Hortons is a very popular uh, coffee shop yeah. in Canada. Whenever we say Tim Hortons, just replace it in your mind with Dunkin' Donuts. But you guys having said one cream, one sugar, that makes one cream, cream, two, two sugars. Sugar. Yeah. Please, Tyler. A but, single double. You on. said one cream, one sugar, which is not wrong. wrong. Yeah. That would be all right. Walk me through one cream, two sugars. You know what a double double is. Also, something that I think may only exist in Canada, which could also be a problem for people outside understanding this. It's generally understood by the public that a double double is two creams, two sugars. Mm -hmm. It's probably the most popular way to get your coffee. It is. I found it recently also known as regular. Oh, really? Yeah, weird, right? It's crazy. That blew my mind as well. And so, if I order a single double, presumably I'm asking for one of one thing and two of the other thing. And I think, as Chaz does, that it's one 
cream, two sugars. Chaz, your thoughts on this? I think you would say it like that because usually when you're there and they ask what you want, they say cream and sugar. Nice. And they say it in that order, cream first, then sugar. That it? I agree. I totally agree. Tyler, do you have a rebuttal? Uh, I hadn't thought of it as in, oh, I'm getting a, a single comma double as in like filling in points on a... Oh, whatever. interesting. Like, so you say, thought like... Oh, it's like a spreadsheet. Oh, double, double in terms of like yeah. columns, cream and sugar. If it's yeah. single, so a double, double, So you that think makes a double is like cream and sugar because it's two things? Is that what you're saying? If you're saying a single double is if you're like if, if you said let me get a double you would interpret that as cream and sugar hmm I really don't order enough coffee. That's an interesting take. I'd never thought of it that way. I always thought of it as like two of this, two of this. But I think we should move on from our thoughts about coffee to our thoughts about Pinkerton. True. The greatest That's a good albums point. of all time. Whoa. Objectively. I mean don't spoil uh don't spoil the ending. We are talking <laughs> about Pinkerton today. Chaz. Yeah. Let's set the stage a little bit. Blue comes out in nineteen ninety four. Mm-hmm. Pinkerton comes out in nineteen ninety six. Mm-hmm. Correct. Quick summarization of what the band has been up to mm. in that time. September twenty fourth, nineteen ninety six. Say we li- we talk about blue. What we don't talk about is what happens after that comes out. And from True. my rough new Weezer fan knowledge is that it becomes a huge seller. They go on tour and are catapulted really quickly into a spot in 90s rock music. Yeah, they drop blue and then they blew up. What goes on with the band between Blue and Pinkerton? Just so, just to get us in the mood for talking about these songs. All right, so to get us horny for after <laughs> after the initial release of uh, Blue, it really was extensive touring to promote the album. After that, all over the U.S. and then they started doing Europe, U.S. again, some Canada. They started throwing in a couple of the earlier songs off of Pinkerton into the mix, like Tired of mm. Sex and Get You, were played at a lot of Blue album tour shows and then uh, they began work on their second album which was a concept album like a rock opera uh, songs from the black hole which eventually got scrapped that was primarily rivers by himself working on that is that am i correct in that uh yeah from my from my understanding i'm it was like a lot like the blue album in pinkerton it was uh kind of rivers working on all the songs himself and then kind of taking it to the studio and everyone else recording along with him and we will probably at some point talk about songs from the black hole of course of when course. we get into the b-sides off the song we won't i think there's one b-side or unreleased track that we will get into a little bit but i don't think on this that, episode yeah yeah but much like yeah. the last episode where we didn't cover any of the b-sides or any of the stuff on the blue deluxe edition i think we'll save that for a future episode right. if there was like a movie of pinkerton i think when the curtain goes up it's like rivers is at harvard that's sort of a byproduct of him becoming sort of disillusioned with the rock star kind of lifestyle. Is that fair to say? Yeah, kind of that along with he doesn't think people are taking his music seriously. People think they're kind of just a novelty because of the Buddy Holly video, which is why he really wanted uh, even like the Say It Ain't So video to be more like mellow. He didn't want it to be gimmicky at all, which is why he kind of went there to study like music composition and stuff, Mm -hmm. really to take his songwriting to the next level so that it wouldn't be seen as like super generic or like poppy or simple. Yeah, I have here that he was sort of feeling constrained almost by rock as a genre. Like he sort of felt like it, it has sort of its rote sort of cliches or... It's got its know. four chords. There was even a line in uh, Falling For You about like, what could you possibly see in little old three chord me? Mm. Which think kind of comes into play there with his like perception of himself I guess yeah and going deeper with his music I think that's sort of a natural connection to Madama Butterfly Mm -hmm. which is obviously thematically and sort of lyrically a big inspiration or thematic element on this album because even the title Pinkerton Pinkerton was uh, the main character's name from that play along with an image from the uh, play being used as the single cover for the El Scorcho single. Let's let's just level with you guys here. I don't know that much about Madama Butterfly. No, I I pretty much know only what I know from (laughs) as is directly linked to to this album Pinkerton. Of course. But The main character, his name is B.F. Pinkerton, boyfriend Pinkerton, I assume. Sort of the idea is that he is like an American a-hole who ends up in Japan or 
not or is somehow linked to Japan. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like basically the stereotypical ignorant American. And that's sort of the idea that Rivers is channeling on a lot of this album. <laughs> I don't know why I'm asking yeah. that as a question because I assume that no <laughs> one here knows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely something that he took a lot of inspiration from. Uh, I have here that it, it sort of goes into him looking for deeper emotional resonance in his songs. I mean, yeah. like an opera, yeah. obviously, pretty melodramatic, pretty emotionally deep. And I think Songs from the Black Hole, often referred to as a rock opera, sci-fi rock opera. I think this is a very operatic album. Yeah. When I think about that. Well, yeah, it, it definitely is, I'd say, because the whole thing is just a tragedy, right? It's pretty much him complaining about everything. On <laughs> can, can you think of a song on the album that's not him complaining? Uh, no, <laughs> I thought for like three seconds, and it's like every every song, almost every chorus of the album is like him just being like, "Why? Yeah, <laughs> like why is this happening?" Literally in one song, and in in multiple songs. Yeah, well, why bother across the sea? Exactly. Oh yeah. Exactly. Definitely a lot of whinging, as the Brits say. Comparing it to Blue, because obviously that's sort of the natural thing you want to do, because they're right next to each other they're the two i'd say classic albums in the weezer canon you always want to sort of look to them and compare the two i mean we could do an entire episode just comparing the different elements on each side but i don't think the lyrical content is that much of a departure from blue necessarily uh word i wrote down we all took notes listening to Pinkerton. Hey, very, a lot of uh, work goes yeah. into preparing for this. Yeah. Academic podcast. What usually happens is I sit for 10 minutes, I read Wikipedia, I write some <laughs> point form notes, and then we record. Yeah, I uh, had yeah. my phone open Googling some stuff during this recording already, <laughs> just to make sure I wasn't saying anything stupid. There's a lot of continuity between Blue and Pinkerton, but the word I have written down a bunch is unhinged, especially the first three songs. Blue has a lot of composure. Like, they, you get the feeling that their shirt's kind of, kind of buttoned all the way up. Even songs like the sweater song, where it ends in this dramatic ending where these freaking out and doing all these musical things things come back together very quickly for the next song mm -hmm. and there's things, this... things fall apart in a very structured manner yeah. yeah and with pinkerton there's just this sense of like he is just all over the map and the whole band is committing to this complete loss of composure yeah it feels like for most of the songs definitely a goal of theirs was to emulate or sort of get a sound that was closer to their live performances the vocals i saw in my research they were recorded live there were no vocal overdubs like when it was brian and matt singing harmonies they were singing them together and it was also self-produced Mm -hmm. No more uh, Rick Ocasek. See you, Rick. Yeah. Enjoy the bad brains. Enjoy sort of driving in your cars. <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> it's something you hear right away when you talk about Pinkerton is very raw sound. Definitely some grunge influences in there. A much like, darker sound. Like Blue, yeah. in comparison, is so much more polished yeah, and shiny. So clean and tight and sort of like airless almost. Actually, there was a uh, radio interview with Weezer shortly after the album came out, and some some kid calls in and asks, uh, "So, like, your first album, like, it was cool, but it sucked, and you know, this one, it sucks, but it's cool, right?" <laughs> and uh, that's a pretty perfect yeah descriptor of those two. I, yeah. Eventually, Rivers kind of goes on to say, like, you know, our first album, we were so nervous. Like, we wanted everything to be perfect. This was going to be the first sound of, like, Weezer that, like, everyone would hear. So they put in all this work and production time to make everything perfect and sound clean. And then for this one, they realized, like, oh, maybe it's not such a big deal. Like, let's kind of be ourselves. They went, let's... fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, like, maybe we can talk about this after we dive into the album itself, but I really think that that mindset that they had going into this album and then the subsequent critical response to the album really, like, shapes their career in a very, very major way. Like, I feel like it's very easy to chart the story of Weezer and I feel like this is like a very big turning point but again, yeah we can we can get to that in a sec 
I want to just jump back real quick to something that you said, Tyler. I thought it was interesting that you used the word character when you're talking about like Rivers singing, because like it, it is a, a very honest album and I, you could say a very real album, but I, I get what you mean by the idea of a character. Actually, right before the album came out, Rivers sent out a letter to members of the Weezer fan club, basically saying that some of these lyrics, they may seem like mean spirited, they may seem sexist, like I may seem like an asshole but it's me trying to explore this different, darker side of myself. So do you, want, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about the idea of him as a character or approaching his lyrics in a specific mindset on the album? Hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a lot. I would probably have better insight like when we get to songs one by one. Going True. through all of it, it really seems like he's really chronicling. When you're in a very bad mental spot, like for months at a time, you kind of get into this phase of like breakdowns becoming kind of par for the course. You cycle through a lot of thoughts. You like have, kind of lose track of what you are feeling because you're so inside of your own thoughts and feelings that you can't, you like you don't even realize that you're mad or bitter about something because that's you are so completely consumed by those feelings. So that's the feeling I get mm. with this where he's hitting a lot of angles at once because he wants to be channeling that emotional basket case feeling of feeling pulled in every which to, like every single direction, not knowing which way to go in and just knowing that everything you're feeling is not okay. In my opinion, when he... <laughs> hmm. All right. Chaz, you had, a, you had a thoughtful look on your face. Do you have anything No, to I was just laughing at how much time we wasted talking about the, du the single double. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's good content. That's yeah. what podcasts are built on. <laughs> Were you done, Tyler? <laughs> no, I wasn't. Okay, continue, I just looked please. at Chaz making a face and was like, oh, maybe he has something important to say. <laughs> No, honestly, I have no idea what you guys are talking about right now. I was looking at stuff on my phone. <laughs> One person starts talking, and the other two zone out completely. Well, I wasn't, hey, I wasn't zoning out. I actually half-assed podcast. <laughs> huh? What? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. I actually, I want to read uh, a quote here. It's actually from his Harvard application letter when he was applying for classical composition. Uh, he says, Fans ask me all the time what it is like to be a rock star. I can tell that they're dreaming as I dreamed when I was a kid of someday ruling the world with a rock band. I tell them the same thing I would tell any young rock star to be. You will get lonely. You will meet 200 people every night, but each conversation will generally last approximately 30 seconds and consist of you trying to convince them that no, you do not want their underwear. Then you will be alone again in your, hotel, in your motel room. Or you will be on your bus in your little space trying to kill the nine hours it takes to get to the next city, whichever city it is. This is the life of a rock star. You really, uh, like, you hit the nail on yeah. the head. Like, I really like the idea of, like, what if that question was, like, are you familiar with, like, sheet music? <laughs> Do you know, like, what is your experience with musical theory? <laughs> <laughs> Can you play piano? <laughs> but he yeah. can't really. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, and in like, conclusion, no, I cannot read sheet music. But yeah, you, I mean, I think just based on that, you absolutely nailed, we'll get into it later, that the recordings, a lot of them coming from the songs from the Black Hole era is called Alone, mm -hmm. the, that they're, they're Rivers' home recordings. And I think that sense of loneliness is very... Yeah, loneliness pervasive. and isolation kind of pervade every single note on this album. But in terms of him doing a character, I really don't know how I feel about the idea of him... Yeah, I know. I, like, I didn't. I didn't mean to imply. No, you that, weren't endorsing. Uh, he was it, saying. Yeah. No, no, not or, or not even to say that. Um, that he was saying that this wasn't a real thing because I think I think it is a real part of himself, and I think that oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, I think that he's just like very much like seeking out this specific part of his psyche to sort of draw it from. I will feel genuinely bad if anyone feels hurt by my lyrics, but I really wanted these songs to be an exploration of my dark side all of the parts of myself that I was either afraid or embarrassed to think about before. So there's some pretty nasty stuff on there. You may be more forgiving of the lyrics if you see them as passing low points in a larger story. And this album really is a story, the story of the last two years of my life. And as you're probably well aware, these have been two very weird years. So again, I think Ooh. I think that everything you said, yeah. even not knowing that I was going to read you these quotes, I think everything you said is very, very accurate. It's sort of this very tumultuous 
And then at these low points, that's what he's tapping into to find this voice, even if it's not like him, but it is part of him. Mm -hmm. But unless anyone has anything else they want to say, that quote feels like the perfect lead into us starting to rank the songs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We can get right into it. If you if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't listened to this album, oh. you're doing yourself a massive disservice. It's a very short album. Like I think "Why Bother" is the perfect example of a song where it's like this could be twice as long and still be a really good song. Oh yeah. But they just did what they needed to do, and then it ended. When I was taking mm -hmm. notes with Chaz. About halfway, it turned is like it's so hard to write note things down because they are moving so fast. Each song is three minutes. As soon as you have some grand thought about one song that you want to write down, they've moved on to the next one. It is everything is so crisp and concise. Yeah, and like and just like the density of the musical and lyrical ideas, they're like it's because it's the same as the blue album where they have these little flourishes and where a chorus will change from one part of the song to the next. But instead of being like two minutes later, it's like. 30 seconds later, it's like, oh, now they're doing this, and now they're done. There really aren't that many bands like that where they started with a very high concept idea. Like, it started out as a... A rock opera. A rock opera, yeah. A uh, opera, if you will. It almost mm. feels like very early in their career for them to be, like, thinking about that. Like, a year after their debut album, they yeah. start recording, like, a concept, like, space rock <laughs> yeah. opera. I mean, that seems typical, like, fame goes to your head, and you've got... You know, like one hit wonder and you like blow up and you start thinking like oh my goodness we have to follow it up immediately with like the best thing ever that's true yeah, I, I feel like see that. I feel like if your debut album gets you big you sort of go in one of two directions you try and make the same album again or you try and make something that sounds nothing like the first yeah. album yeah for and sure. this is definitely the latter and like obviously well, on both sides you can have varying degrees of success mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like some bands make careers off of doing the same album over and over again such as Weezer. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, actually, maybe not so much. I was going to say The Strokes' first two albums. but Sure, yeah. I think that's yeah. a reasonable uh, comparison. Ooh, and then you have, yeah, like, that is a good one. But I think Arcade Fire is a good example of a band which changes every album, or Bonnie Vare as well. We've actually, I feel like, Tyler, we've had this exact conversation before. So very quickly, I'll run down the tracks, starting off at the top. Tired of Sex, Get You, No Other One. Why Bother, Across the Sea, The Good Life, El Scorcho, Pink Triangle, Falling for You, and Butterfly. As with before, we're going to kick it off at the bottom. Once again, common theme, we ranked all of our song, all the songs on the album 1 to 10, and then we collated that to get us a sort of holistic uh, ranking. And once again, we have a unanimous <laughs> bottom song, which is Butterfly. 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 More like, but... Fly. I mean, I feel like this song gets ripped on by a lot of people, and there's also a lot of like diehard Butterfly fans who think like this is the most beautiful song Rivers has mm -hmm. ever composed. But I mean, like it just drags on at points. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a minute and a half song that drastically outstays it its so welcome. Long. It's it kind of did the reverse of uh, why bother. Like they kind of <laughs> should have switched it, taken some of that extra time from Butterfly and put that to why bother <laughs> it drags on this kind of makes you cringe at points yeah yeah that, there's I mean, like, one line that really makes me cringe every time you can probably guess that it's i did what my body told me to <laughs> which <laughs> is that, like, you don't want to think there's, about rivers too much. <laughs> there's a very pervading pervasive theme of creepiness on this album where true yeah in some songs he is fully aware of it he's perceiving himself as creepy and he's reacting to that and sometimes he's just like I'm sorry for what I did. My, I did what my body told me to, and it's like, oh, yucky. That... yucky. <laughs> no um, one has ever pitied someone for doing what their body told them to. That's exactly. True. And uh, I feel like we're going to be shitting on this song a lot over the next like minute or two. So I just kind of want to say that I still think it's like a sweet song. I think it's a nice way to close the album. It's soft. I I do enjoy the song, although. I don't listen to it all the way through <laughs> I, every time I listen to Pinkerton. I'll usually finish Falling for You and say, what a great album. <laughs> well, it's like uh, starting the Blue Album on... Uh, <laughs> on no one else. On no one else. I have been known to do that before. Yeah. I will go one step further and say, I don't think this is a good song. It's a very classic thing to do to like close your album with 
an acoustic ballad. Like That's I something like... Weezer has done better on other albums. Exactly. <laughs> I think I think this is in very sharp contrast to the well, yeah. epicness of Only in Dreams and how that closed the That's album. That's true, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like you can go one of two ways and they, they went the, the soft route and like that can work sometimes and then other times it just sort of feels this isn't the music you make and so when you're trying to do that you don't always execute it as well as the songs that you normally do which I think is the case here. Yeah, I think something else, I understand that it's supposed to sound like all acoustic and just River sitting down with an acoustic guitar, but like this really almost does not feel like a finished track in both terms of like recording quality and kind of production. It feels like he just kind of wrote it. It was a first draft and just said, fuck it. Like, we'll do it live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, every time I hear it, some part of my body is waiting for the drums to come in. And then yeah. they don't ever really do it. And it's always like, a, oh, like when the acoustic guitar starts playing, you could to- totally hear how the drums could just build in and like wash out and it would be a nice peaceful ending. But it never hits that peaceful note. And it's hard to criticize people for the way they pronounce things in songs. But... <laughs> The way he says, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, oh, I was going to let someone else bring so that up. Is the worst possible way that you could say it. And it only ever makes me think of these people who turn apologies around on you. You go, hey, you did one thing and it's bad. They go, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so, I'm such a piece of shit. I, 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 there's nothing. I should just kill myself. And you end up going like, no, wait, no, don't do that. And they never apologize just for the thing that they, that they did, which is totally a tactic. So whenever he says that, it just put, puts that right in my head and be like, I'm sorry. And I don't like it. It makes me think of, um, there's a John Mulaney bit about him getting, what's what's the name of that where they put the finger in your butt to like check for uh, <laughs> prostate cancer? Oh. Like a, <laughs> like a prostate yeah. test or yeah. whatever? Yeah. Prostate yeah. check? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a bit, like, it's a bit about him getting a prostate <laughs> check. <laughs> And it's about and when the guy puts it in, he goes, first he goes, oh, and then he goes, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what it always makes me think. It's like, I'm sorry. And it, it's very, it's a lot. Yeah, there's and a lot of like self-hatred as performance. It's like, oh, I'm I'm the worst. And yeah. It's like, like very like, woe is, I mean, like the whole album is like that, but yeah, I feel like yeah. when you do an acoustic ballad, like, you need some degree of, like... You also just need other things going on in the song. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, let's let's talk about it, because Chaz and I, we've talked about this a lot, and we're going to get to the, the aforementioned B-side, which is we yes. think that Pinkerton is, like, a 10 out of 10 album, but if you take out Butterfly and insert the B-side, cool. Long Time Sunshine, again, even even probably if you're a Weezer fan, you might not be aware of this song... Go check it out. Mm-hmm. It's so good. My theory is that it's so good, and it, and, it, and it does the same thing. It is not a heavy song. It is, for the most part, mainly piano. And then, like like you said, like with the drums, they come in very yeah, softly, exactly. and they sort of disappear very softly. And it does the exact same things, but it is an incredible song. A couple of things I want to touch on with that, too, especially if you've never heard this song. There are a couple other songs you might want to listen to before. I think you're going to want to check out Blast Off, as well as I Just Threw Out the Love of My Dreams, one of the B-sides to The Good Life. But I think we should also say that uh, I don't think this would actually be considered a B-side. This was just kind of... True, an an unreleased... Yeah, an unreleased track... That unrecorded was, even really because well i mean the, oh, no, the rec- it, was, it was recorded yeah. as a band because yeah because oh, a lot of like blast off and the other songs that are kind of incorporated into it a lot of them come from alone which is like his home recordings or like his own personal demos well is that only is that not only true? blast off is right. the only one that's off there because i just threw out the love of my dreams was a b-side that was released in 96 mm-hmm. but that one also was originally written for songs from the black hole right yes it features i Rachel Hayden. Uh, Rachel. I almost said Petra Hayden. She's in (laughs) the band That Dog and involved with the uh, rentals and stuff. Yeah, and she was originally going to be like a character in Songs from the Black Hole. Yeah, it's important to listen to uh, I Just Threw Out the Love of My Dreams and Blast Off, as well as obviously the rest of the album, before listening to this song. I think after hearing it, you'll kind of see why. Yeah, Yeah, I uh, I almost don't want to give anything away. Oh, of course not, of course not. It's such a fantastic song. (laughs) I just heard it for the first time like 15 minutes before 
for Tyler. We start recording, and it really is an insane experience. Yeah. And the song takes you to another it's, dimension. Imagine listening to the Abbey Road medley for the first <laughs> time, but better. <laughs> <laughs> but better, because it's Weezer. On Only in Dreams, another album closer, yeah. it's like, this is a really good song. And like once it hits that moment, the it's, sort of coda, yeah. you can't even like talk. Like yeah. <laughs> You cover your face with your hand. You're just like, is this real? Like What is happening? This is crazy. And there's a very similar moment on Long Time Sunshine when it hits that <laughs> upper <laughs> echelon of... When Chaz and Chris got to... So- watch me experience it's true and like yeah. and literally everyone i've ever played it for that like at least like has an understanding of weezer has reacted in the same way but we're talking about butterfly yeah, which <laughs> which i always thought butterfly was kind of a boring album closer as is but after hearing uh long time sunshine and knowing that they're like they were thinking about using that as the album closer i almost get mad when i <laughs> yeah. hear when i hear butterfly sometimes i'll even get all the way to falling for you and then in itunes i'll hit play up next for uh, <laughs> long time sunshine and just close the album that way yeah i think it says a lot about butterfly that most of your time devoted to talking about it can be spent talking about how another song would be better <laughs> like in its position fulfilling the same role like, yeah and once you hear that song you go like what kind of conversations did they have where <laughs> someone went yeah you know what butterfly is the better closer i can almost see a bill burr piece <laughs> on that <laughs> That's true. He loves those imagined <laughs> conversations. So we will move on to the ninth place track on our uh, on our combined lists, which is Pink Triangle. Ooh. Surprising. Wow. It was not my number nine. I will say that. It was not my number nine either. Tyler. It was my number nine. Tell us about it. <laughs> it's... It's... Again, we've talked about this, and we will definitely talk about it again a hundred more times. It's like, is he being serious or is he yeah. joking? And, this... and if he, even even if he is joking, is it okay that he's joking? Like, <laughs> no. Okay, it's okay for him to joke, but... Like, does it make it any better that he is self-aware yeah. making this? Because <laughs> listening to it, my mind cuts right at this. It'd be so Weezer if there was a bit more humor in it. And he went like, oh, yeah. silly me. How could I not notice? It is a very Weezer thing to, like, hit on a girl and then have her turn out to be gay. Well, <laughs> maybe not turn out to be gay, but have her tell you that she's gay. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's more Weezer. <laughs> Which is like, it's it's so close. Like, oh, the floral prince, like, she's wearing a pink triangle on her sleeve. And then he goes, let me know the truth. And it's like, uh, you're so close to being like, like, I'm so desperate for love that I'm asking gay girls out. and Or just like choosing to ignore like obvious signs. I mean, yeah, like, that would and you be can extend joke. it. Yeah, because yeah, you can extend it beyond like literally like, I'm not attracted to men and, it, and extend it to being like, I'm not attracted to you. Yeah. Because that's, like, I think a very Weezer thing. It's just, like, being so desperate or, like, wanting this thing so much that you're choosing to ignore all these signs to the contrary. Yeah. I almost think that it kind of goes with this theme of Rivers, like, fantasizing about shit that's, like, never gonna happen. True, yeah. Like, getting obsessed Wanting over what he can't stuff. Have. Like, we were we'll good as married about... in my mind, yeah. but married in my mind's no good. And, like, that's... across the sea yeah, and stuff yeah, like that. for sure. I'm really surprised that this came in ninth. I mean, no, I think I, I, to be fair, I ranked it as number eight. I do have some nice things to say about this song, though, as well. There's kind of the whole double guitar solo I think is kind of cool. I don't think it's anything too insane, but I like how it kind of sounds like the stereo thing, the two different guitars going. And then I like the transition from that into the final chorus where, mm. you know, they kind of change up the chords and they've got the... Yeah, the drums. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I think I think it's a great song musically. Oh, I love yeah. the instrument. I will say this is one of the better intros. Yeah. With the little I guitar think, chiming think, in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think I it's that. I think it's a really cool intro as well, and I really like just the way they sing the beginning of each verse, or the way Rivers sings the beginning of each verse. I don't know. I really like the melody there. Although there's just something about this song that doesn't really click with me. I almost find it kind of like the undone of this album. I think they're both fine songs. I think they're both good songs. And whenever they come on, I was jammed to them. But like, I feel like they don't click with me the way they click with a lot of other Weezer fans. That's true. That's yeah. a good point. I definitely feel the same way about Undone. I, I feel like on a musical level, this clicks with me. But yeah, like, the lyrics and the same with Unknown, where it's like it feels like it lacks a certain like substance or a certain depth yeah, underneath. Like I, I almost think it's it lacks a certain catchiness almost. 
because like in theory like i think all the individual parts all sound fine i just don't know what it is that doesn't click with me Mm -hmm. and i think it's interesting to know that like this was sort of released as the third single of the album it wasn't really fully released they sent out a promo cd to radio Mm -hmm. stations with a remix which i do think is better that's true but the uh, guitar is louder right yeah we've listened to that before yeah we've talked about that off mic before but yeah. i don't i don't really remember enough <laughs> about that to talk about it <laughs> here now i think that kind of goes also with a theme weezer gen really like picking horrible songs to release as singles yeah i mean we can we'll talk about it when we get to, we'll talk uh, about that when we, we get, get to every other album <laughs> as well <laughs> yeah, that's true but yeah as we as we move further up the rankings and get to some of like the really great songs yeah it, it is it is a weird choice it's one of the more i'd say radio friendly songs despite the lyrical content it's one of the more like structured songs right yeah like compared to something like why bother which is an amazing song but it would be really weird as a single like I, kind of all the well, songs on I'll this talk, album. I'll, I'll touch on that when we get there true maybe i'm just not a radio person but it seems like any of these songs except maybe the good life if i heard it on the radio I'd be like what are they doing just yeah. in general this is kind of i think Tired we'll get to sex. this <laughs> we'll get to this i feel when we yeah. cover all the songs this album was just not made for radio and weezer has very much always had their head in radio and judged a lot of and their pop, successes yeah. by yeah radio and this album is just not radio fair i really like the <coughs> instrumentation a lot but vocals just don't they don't do it that for level. <laughs> things like just looking at the lyrics lines like my mind begins the arrangements like <laughs> something about that's true just like, oh, it's, it's a little clunky and things like might have smoked a few of my time but never thought it was a crime and then he just doesn't mention drugs again yeah it's kind of like really yeah what is some it? stuff in this song i don't really understand <laughs> yeah. and yeah a lot of i've got a bunch of vocal nitpicks uh he really really flubs that line of knew the day would surely come he does this little vocal flourish <laughs> yeah. and he really does not do that well it, it speaks to like the rawness but mm. it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't yeah i feel other vocally awkward moments of pinkerton shines through a lot better i think like I mean, part of me almost enjoys like imperfections like that i don't know why but they've always had a special place in my heart yeah for oh sure. yeah like me too and i feel the other imperfection in this album have made it mean so much to me and this one just doesn't i just hear it and every time I'm like Ooh, ugh. yeah do it do it do one over that brother <laughs> <laughs> do better <laughs> um no i definitely one of the weaker songs on the album but i am surprised to see it coming at the number nine position yeah, i don't think it's the second you can throw a butterfly <laughs> like yeah not only because it's like probably unanimously like not the best song but also just because like it is very different from all the other songs mm-hmm. i don't think this is the worst like rocking song on the album i'm pretty sure i know what the next one is going to be <laughs> yeah, <laughs> i think you do uh the next song number wait, eight the math wrong? oh my gosh this just in. <laughs> I don't know how to add three single digit numbers together. And we actually have a tie for ninth place. Or I guess eighth place, technically. We talked about this last time. When we make this list, we rank all of uh, the songs on an album from one to ten. Then we add those numbers up and use that to create a list of what our ranking is when we're going to discuss. And I can't add, <laughs> guys. I added nine nine and six and came up with 21 (laughs) (laughs) that's that's a flub and a half it's late we record very late it's true notoriously late this is interesting because we 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 were just talking about how uh there was a tie on the last album before we started recording and now we have this little bonus tie that's just revealed (laughs) itself you probably know what's coming it's get you Gotcha. Which both you and I have as the number nine song. Ooh. So Tyler. Yeah. What's so great about <laughs> Get You? Why am I always the one to to go to bat, shit on a song, or defend it? That's part of what makes it interesting. Okay. Because you're you're coming from a different place. You yeah. haven't listened to the album as much as we have. You haven't. You don't have necessarily. Yeah. A broad view. I'm going to say this is, might be a reverse of Pink Triangle. This is one where the instrumentals can't really keep up with the vocals for me. I empathize a lot with the situation that he's describing of obviously a romantic situation and you're starting to lose your sense of humor about the situation. Because mm. a great pop song is just an emotional snapshot. This is what you're feeling right now. Right. And I feel like he gets through... Gets through. 
Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty funny. It's the second song on the album, so we listened to Tide of Sex first, being the first track, and I wrote, man, these guys are sounding very unhinged with the blue album fresh in my mind. Mm -hmm. They're really just rocking out and not really caring. And then you get to get you, and it's even more raucous and unrehearsed almost than Tired of Sex. And I was like, wow. And then I really, really like the lyric right at the end where he goes, what I did to them, you did to me. Yeah. Where you're lo he's losing his sense of humor about this situation. And also, this is an angle that he doesn't really approach in any other song. It's like a real asshole being shown the error of his ways and being yeah. like, maybe I'm the guy. <laughs> maybe I'm the problem. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I feel he get, kind of gets closest in this song. This is one of the songs I wrote less for just because I don't really know what to write about this a lot. That was definitely something that a uh, whole part that Tyler brought up. I really enjoy that part as well as the whole kind of this is beginning to hurt that just kind of mm -hmm. keeps going towards the end. Getting off topic from uh, lyrical content but just kind of production of it and how the song sounds. I think that Brian really comes through with a lot of great backing vocals that really contribute a lot to the song when you listen to it it adds i think more depth because i think brian really does have a good voice and i feel like mm -hmm. it's very underutilized in weezer although i'd say this album uses his voice yeah. better than most other albums and i'm gonna talk about that a little more when we get to one of the other songs yeah really but really interesting harmonies on this album in kind of the context of the album it's kind of interesting because the first four songs all have a very like raw messy intro to them i guess if you can call the beginning bit of why bother yeah. like an intro with a <laughs> yeah the first four really have that kind of raw intro that kind of just signify like right there that like this is a messy album this is not something that we tried to clean up and polish and make sound good for like the radio we weren't making this for everyone else we were making this for us mm -hmm. I I don't have a lot to say about this song because I don't like it that much. The chorus. It's not good. <laughs> it's, a, it's one word. Which is, like, fine. It's, I guess it's two words. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. well, it, it, yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's three it's, words. It's three words, none of which exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. And maybe it's just the the way it's like structured like the chords the fact that like it doesn't really feel like it resolves until like very close to the end i feel like it plays with the same ideas like especially musically like that's present on other songs but other songs sort of present them in a more cohesive way yeah big time and so that's where it kind of falls flat for me it's like oh like you're like playing with the same kind of palette that you're using on the rest, but it doesn't really, like, it doesn't cross over from just a bunch of noodling around to, like, a good song for me. Discounting Butterflies this is probably the weakest hook on yeah, the whole album. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Especially because... <laughs> <laughs> for sure. There's nothing interesting going on in the chorus at all. Mm -hmm. Like, the guitars aren't doing anything interesting, the drums aren't doing anything interesting, the vocals aren't doing anything interesting. So, head-to-head, -head, get you versus pink triangle pink triangle i would pick over get you it sucks a lot less <laughs> i just think overall like objectively it's a more interesting song for sure more interesting lyrics even though they are kind of very stupid at times yeah, i mean not really much else to say it's a lot catchier even though i don't find pink triangle all that catchy mm -hmm. all right i'm coming to you tyler this really shines light on something we've talked about off mic where it's really hard to rank the songs on this album yeah. there are yeah. definitely ones that are way better than others but once you start stacking them all up together you start going what the because yeah, that that i think that's where you get to the biggest stumbling is like when you just have two songs and it's like which one of these yeah. do i like more which one of these is better because i did put get you quite a bit higher yes than... you had it at number six yeah wow pink triangle at number nine genuinely shocked <laughs> <laughs> thinking about it now in terms of things that they are trying to accomplish in each song yeah pink triangle i think is the better song okay yeah i think it's a clean sweep i think it's a, a pretty solid like consensus among weezer fans that like get you is debatably the shittiest song on the album there's still nothing wrong with the song it's like we talked about last week, the worst Weezer song is still better than the best <laughs> non-Weezer song. That's true. It's right, it's, yeah, regard, it's definitely in the top 150 or so songs of all time. 
<laughs> of course. Like I said, like Get You just to me is just like not even like a song. It's just Yeah, it's just something you have to get past. <laughs> We're like really shitting on this album. I well, I mean like we can't switch it around and talk about our favorite songs and be like, eh, and these other ones aren't that great. Like yeah. we have to move That's through true. from starting, our least favorite to the favorite. Starting ones. at the bottom makes more sense. And like yeah. of course, I mean, like, of course. Yeah. I mean like get you I don't know if I can extend Get You the same courtesy that I would like. Like the other eight songs, I can say like, these are all great songs. Like even the eighth best song is a very, very good song. I don't think Get You is a great song. Yeah, I'm with you on that. <laughs> Tyler, <laughs> yeah. Tyler is begrudgingly <laughs> nodding. <laughs> yeah, right. So it's settled. Number nine will be Get You. Apologies to math teachers everywhere. Number eight will be Pink Triangle. I hope math teachers never listen to this podcast. <laughs> I hope math teachers send me letters uh, accepting my apology. <laughs> We're now moving on to number seven on our list, which is No Other One. A somewhat surprising place for it, even though this is the place that I had it on the list. <laughs> Once I get past Get You, this is the point where I'm like, you just gotta put something at the bottom. Yeah. Like that for me, it really is the bottom three on this album always stay the same. The same three are always in my top three. My number one's always my number one on this album. It's the middle four. Like, every single day it changes mm -hmm. almost. Yeah. It, so this like, is... Truly, we could, we could, we could, like, Stop recording. Go listen to the album. Come back, and we would have could easily have a different, different list. list. Exactly. The accountant in me wants to say uh, this is like a snapshot out of date, like a balance sheet, <laughs> and not an income statement that uh, reflects oh, the cool. whole year. <laughs> wow. What, what song are we talking about? Yeah, we're talking about no other one. <laughs> mm. Man, I'm looking back at my list and like, maybe I'm just really tired and the fact that I changed it all, a lot of things right before I gave my list to you. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I put, get you that high. <laughs> and, uh, I think to a certain degree, like if someone has a particularly strong opinion on something, then hearing them talk about, yeah, like if I go into a movie and I'm like, yeah, I liked that. And then someone really hated it and they enumerate all the ways that they hated it. Usually I find myself saying like, yeah, th those are all valid criticisms and maybe it like brings it a little lower in my mind. It's like The Last Jedi with me. The more I talked about it with people, the less I liked it. That's true. That's why I've, I've mainly not talked to people about it because like, I was like, I enjoyed it. I'm going to keep enjoying it, yeah, and so I'm just not going to, like... But yeah, I've elected not to talk about it with a bunch of people because pe a bunch of friends really, really liked it, and it's like, if you like a movie, you don't want to sit around someone else who's like, no, I didn't like it. That's so, true. like, why would I rattle off all my problems with it? This one, like, I dig it. It's a great song. I don't have that many, that much to say in my notes in terms of where it fits in the album. Song number three, I was looking at it, I was like, oh, this reminds me a lot of Beatles albums where they're writing almost exclusively about interpersonal relationships and romance, but there's no real through a line. There's no real story to any of their early albums. It's just kind of like, love gone good, love gone bad, love gone this, love gone that. She's uh, far away, she's right here, yeah. These are lyrics, this is good stuff. <laughs> Sorry, go on. They're writing about a topic, but just kind of hitting all angles, and there's no... That was just a thought in my head, like, oh, he's not really telling a story, he's not singing about one girl in particular. He's just kind of swinging for all the fences. This is a song that I really love. There's a lot more value in this song, re-listening to it, than some of the other songs. Off the record, it starts, like, in a similar way to the previous songs, especially, like, Get You and Tired of Sex, how, uh... Just kind of that uh, feedbacky stuff, you know, and then it kind of goes into a really cool intro. I think the more I listen to it, the more I enjoy the instrumentation in it. I love mm -hmm. the backing guitars, or uh, I guess sort of the lead guitar that plays underneath the verses. And uh, I think it's kind of interesting because, I mean, in the last episode, I talked a lot about how Weezer would change up like later choruses to keep it fresh and interesting. I think it's interesting because in this one, they kind of do that with the uh, with the verse. The lyrics on this one are some of my favorite off the album. I think this song is one of the most emotional points off this album. Not the most emotional, but uh, it's very much up there. As well as uh, I think Matt's backing vocals shine through really good on this one. Mm -hmm. The one thing that always sticks out to me with this song is I always compare and contrast it with no one else. There's like, there's some clear sort of parallels there. I mean, the idea of no one else is like, I want my girl to be like this. And if she's not like this, then I'm done. You're wanting these certain things from a person. You're possessive, yeah. Yeah. 
And then I feel like no other one is more like, my girl is these ways and there are things that I don't like, but I don't want to be alone. Therefore, I'm allowing myself. It's all like a bit, it's a bit of like codependency kind of idea. It's very, very uh, contrasted with no one else, which is very like brushes off the actual girl and just being like, I want this, I want that. Whereas with this, it's like, we need each other. Mm -hmm. and, and so like, I'm going to stay here. I really love the way the lyrics like come in, like my girl's a liar, but I'll stand beside her. That's and it's the exact like, same way, like with no one else. My girl's got a big mouth. Yeah, with which she blabbers a lot. It ended up at the bottom, sort of this, this middle area. That I think it's a really good song. I think it's a really interesting song. I really like the intro. Yeah. But, and the way uh, it sort of comes back in the outro with the vocals along with the guitar. Mm-hmm. We're probably going to say this a million more times over the next three songs. But yeah, like at any point, like if we recorded this or wrote our list at like any other point this week or this month, like these middle four ones could have been all very different. We're going to step further into this middle section. The number six song. Am I just, do I have that right? No. What? Oh boy. Hmm. Now the number six. <laughs> well, you were right. You were right. I'm I'm a little surprised, although I think it's an, an I think it's an interesting spot for it. El Scorcho. Ooh. Okay. We all had this right around this spot, mm -hmm. five to seven range. I think I'm a little higher on it than the two of you. Yeah. This was the first single. Yes. Came out a week or so before the album was released. It's a very tough song to slot in because it's such a weird song. It, it sticks out yeah. like a sore thumb. It's a Big very time. weird track. Yeah, it's still every time I was like, this was the lead single. Yeah. It's just like, you've it's got a such terrible a, lead it's single. A terrible, it really is. You've got is. such a tight, like six songs, which are some of the best, tightest rock songs you are ever going to make. And you pick El Scorcho with the first <laughs> line being, God damn you half Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> so that they could is, easily be construed as racist as your first line. You know, I feel like Rivers has been pretty open about his, like, penchant for Japanese. His, his gross fetish. <laughs> gross? <laughs> his regular fetish. <laughs> his preferences? I mean, let's <laughs> not get into it. <laughs> I like that he says half. <laughs> Along with no other one, I think this is the most, I mean, obviously because it is very, like, concrete and detail. I think it's the most like vivid picture that's painted on Ooh. the album. I really don't know how to feel about this because a big chunk of this song is just this weird thing that I feel certain 60s songwriters did and a lot more people are doing now, but just like name dropping very specific things. References uh. ECW. <laughs> yeah. Like, this like relatively little known wrestling promotion in like the Northeast. I mean, like it wasn't, it was the third biggest <laughs> wrestling promotion yeah. at the time. This song has really swung up in my own private, you know, opinion ever since I first heard it. Like I really, really hated it. The yeah, first time it is like yeah. very, it's very quirky. It's obnoxious. Yeah, that's one of the words I have written down about mm -hmm. it. Which, is, which can be like hard to digest. And like I said this when Taylor Swift's latest album came out. The first single I was very put off by and then yeah. when I heard it in the context of the album I didn't like suddenly love it I was like oh I can see more what you're going for like this is like it's taking an extreme yeah within the sort of broader view of the album but when you're coming in off of the last album which is again very different than the extreme like sticks out so far it's like whoa like you feel like you're in sort of uncharted territory. This song really turned around for me on New Year's Eve. Before I left this apartment, I was very drunk and we just started playing Pinkerton all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> Quick disclaimer. Chaz and Tyler did not spend New Year's Eve alone listening to Pinkerton <laughs> drunk in their apartment. Yeah. Retraction. <laughs> just we add that in there. started New Year's. We later went off and did cool things. I would hit yeah. El Scorcho. Classic. And it really was a sense of like, you know what? Like these guys are so down in the dumps this whole album long. And for El Scorcho, it's really like a breath of fresh air. It's an obnoxious breath of fresh air for the whole run of the album. Like for this song, they just lighten up. Yeah. And like, it's, fun. it's clearly four dudes like in someone's basement, goofing off, throwing all the stuff they can into a song and having a good time. It is like the music of fucking around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, I like that. Like I like coming off of the first, that's what the sixth song on the album, something like that. Uh, seventh song. Seven. Pretty much the first six songs are all like dark, 
chunky riffs like very mm. like heavy guitars and then like it's a slow song it has a weird really weird pace to it like it's like it's not quite a slow song but it just like moves like a little like yeah. sluggishly it kind of like lopes along it doesn't have a guitar going under it like it's just sort of like noodling yeah it really feels like you're like coming up for air a little like okay like just, <laughs> just like, take this, this is weezer after all. just take this one off like have some fun like chill out a little mm-hmm Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I really haven't had a chance to talk about this one yet. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, I wasn't meaning it like that. I just want to make a couple points oh, before no, we move on. No, no, no. Oh, no, yeah. We are well in the middle of talking about El Scorcho. Okay. We're well in the middle of the album, too. Mm. <laughs> Can I go? <laughs> Yes, you have my permission to go. Yeah. We kind of mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of it does feel very quirky and cool. Although I think a lot of it kind of feels dated with that whole sort of like rock, like rap singing. Oh, like, yeah. yeah, I mean, it it's, sounds very 90s. It's not, it's not as bad as the start of Greatest Man That Ever Lived. No, nothing. Yeah, is, it, <laughs> nothing in the world is as bad as that. Yeah. No, but I know what you mean. Like, it sounds like a Beck song. Like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly. The, that's, he's kind of like the OG, or like Cake. I'm not singing, I'm just talking, man. <laughs> yeah. But just speaking some truths. It's interesting, because this, uh, this solo in this song, which I think is a very interesting solo, especially with Matt making all the noises yeah. over it and stuff like that, which really is like, that goes hand in hand with the, like, the song of fucking around. Yeah. This was actually... Uh, Brian's first solo so that was played by Brian and not Rivers hmm. and uh, another Brian first in this one was it was his first chance to actually sing a lead line where uh, in the bridge which I think is the best part of this song when Rivers is like oh how stupid is it I can't right. talk about it I gotta sing about it make a record of it but yeah, while that's off. going on and then Brian comes and goes hey. <laughs> I think Brian just absolutely kills it. Yeah, it's very similar to a uh, sweater song where yeah. like they'll yeah, like where like one of them starts and then the other one comes in yeah. and at first they're the harmony and then they kind of switch spots. Yeah, I think uh, because kind of the rushed nature of the blue album with when they brought Brian in, Brian really didn't get as much of a chance to shine on that album, mm-hmm. I don't think. That really goes to show like what happens when Brian gets more of a chance mm-hmm. to be put on songs. And I yeah. think Brian absolutely makes this song so much better. And I think he makes a lot of this album a lot better. <laughs> We've had whole conversation before about how much we love Brian. He's yeah. He's in my top five Weezers for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't like the line, I'll bring home the turkey if you bring home the bacon. <laughs> That is very that's, stupid. That's I really, really like the line before where it goes, how stupid is it? I can't talk about it. Gotta sing about it and make a record. Yeah, Which, I think that's the best part of it. That is so Rivers being like, guys, I have unresolved issues. And I was all <laughs> going like, wow, all right. <laughs> that is perfect. Rivers like, oh, I'm joking. But also like, oh, there's yeah, so like, much like, stuff. Oh, going. this is a cry for help. Ha ha ha, help me. <laughs> One question I have about this, and because I've, I've never known, that line where it's like, so I went to your room and read your diary, watching grunge like drop new jack through a press table. That whole bit, like, is it the same it- <laughs> thought? Is he reading that from her diary, like watching grunge like drop new jack? By the way, that's the uh, wrestling reference we were talking yeah. about. Watching grunge, I believe he was, oh, can't remember what tag team he was part of, but yeah. He was part of tag team New Jack, very well known in the wrestling mm-hmm. world, notoriously crazy. There's this one famous incident that almost like ruined ECW where this like 17 year old kid was like, let me wrestle. Like I'm a trained wrestler. I trained with this person and was like totally full of shit. And then he was like, hey, New Jack, can you, <laughs> cause there's this thing in wrestling called blading where you like cut your forehead open with like a little like razor blade to like make it look like you're bleeding. Yeah. And so he was like, hey, New Jack, I don't know how to blade. Could you bl- Could you cut my forehead for me? <laughs> oh my and New Jack fuck. was like, sure, kid. <laughs> oh and then he like fuck. did it way too deep, and the kid almost died. <laughs> and it was like a whole thing. Oh, boy. Also, great side note to that. His gimmick was that he was a bus driver, and his wrestler name was Mass Transit. <laughs> it's a great story. New Jack is like notoriously like a piece of garbage, <laughs> like just a bad person. <laughs> 
but that's ECW for you. I really like the lyrics to this song. I love how like dumb and idiosyncratic they are. I think that he is like reading her talking about the things she likes and she's he, and it's like, oh my God, like she likes ECW. Like this is crazy. I never could understand that part. And that line about going to her room and reading her diary, on top of that being a super fucked up thing to do, <laughs> yeah. just like a very Rivers Cuomo Pinkerton-esque thing to do. Creepy. <laughs> yeah, creepy. That line comes right after uh, where she said she'd never heard of Green Day. It would be like... 96 who'd never heard of green <laughs> yeah. day like, i, I thought like, i like almost, proto hipster yeah it, well no exactly because he's like oh how cool is that so i went <laughs> yeah. to your room to read your diary <laughs> yeah like the first few times ever listening to it without really thinking i'm i was always like did he go to her room to see if she'd written anything about <laughs> green day to see if she was bullshitting <laughs> to sound cool <laughs> I, I like think that. I think it makes that a lot funnier. Because Rivers being like, fuck you, I don't believe <laughs> yeah, that. No like, one has Oh yeah, you've never heard of Green Day? <laughs> like, I'm gonna investigate. This. Yes. <laughs> According to my research, uh, it also, you do that, like Green Day. That line also includes uh, a Madam Butterfly reference because listening to Cho Cho Saint yeah, Cho Cho yeah. Saint is the name of That's Madam it. Butterfly in the story slash opera slash what have you. Hmm. Yeah. This was not very successful as a single. Spike Jones offered to do a music video and they turned him down. I think there was some other stuff involved with the music video where yeah, like the guy quit. Yeah, and they, Rivers they, had to edit himself. Yeah, there's two different cuts of the video. Kind of a interesting story there. <laughs> not worth <laughs> talking. Not worth talking it's about. It's interesting, at all. but it's not that interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we will move on to the number five song. I think we're getting right sort of to the end of the middle section, in my opinion, and the top four are pretty unimpeachable in my estimation. The number five song is Falling For You. Oh, Ooh. okay. The one like very clean transition on the album. Yeah. The, oh, it, yeah. it flows right in from Pink Triangle. Mm -hmm. I think this is an amazing track. This one here is constantly uh, fighting for, it's either my second or third position on the album. It can change. Yeah, it was your number yeah. three. Yeah, I put it as my number three, but I almost just said, no, 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 this is going as number two. Ooh. But I don't think that would have really changed much of where it ranked as a whole with us. This easily has some of the most relatable lyrics in the song, and I think it's the most musically interesting song on the album because the chords are not like any other chord progression. This is not a standard chord progression. It's a lot more intricate and like just complex, yet it still manages to be catchy as hell. There's uh, also some really cool uh, like lead guitar bits underneath the uh, verses like in uh, no other one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, for some reason, partly like lyrical subject, partly the sound, but I always connect no other one and this song, like, yeah. in my mind. I think they, like... I, I do as well. Got a nice key change in it. And as well as I think this is the most emotional song on the album. The How Stupid Is It bit from El Scorcho is up there as well. But as a whole song... I think it's a really interesting song lyrically. It's one of the only ones that makes sort of direct reference to the fact that the person singing it is like a famous rock star, I guess across the yeah. scene to a certain degree. Again, references a cello. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, as it does in El Scorcho. I do see this as very much a cousin of no other one because it's the same idea of like almost being afraid or like intimidated by how much you like care about someone. Yeah. Especially with, like, there's rules about old goats like me hanging around with girls like you. Stuff like that. Almost, like, nervous about how it may seem. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Be like, so, like, so nervous. I'm, I don't get this. Like, this is, this is a classic low self-esteem song. Mm -hmm. I think it should also be noted that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is uh, Carl Koch, uh, who's the essentially the fifth member of Weezer. The, the band fifth has, Weezer? Yeah, he's the fifth Weezer, <laughs> essentially. I believe this is Carl Koch's favorite Weezer song. I think this is a huge sleeper track. A lot of people don't give it the credit it deserves. It sort of rides the line, because I think this album has sort of, like, songs that are structured close to pop songs, and then songs that are, like, very weird in their structure, like, not typical song structure. And I think this kind of rides the line between that. Yeah, it rides that line very perfectly. I think of yeah. just being a song that yeah, on the one hand is this very well polished pop song and on the other hand is also just this odd guitar yeah it's like journey it's like three tweaks away from just being like a straight ahead yeah 
like something closer to the more poppy side. Falling for you, I think, is has got the perfect intro. That whole little the those guitars are just like tingling yeah, the away. The delicate and, and then that drops in. That moment before the drop is what makes me think of the album cover every single time. Mm. That specific, wow. just everything about the vibe of I that, like that, where the guitars are just you've got these ascending lines that are just matching each other, and it feels like you are gazing out into that little snowy field. Yeah. With yeah. the cottages. Yeah, we didn't talk about the uh, the album artwork. Japanese, so sort of this running theme, both the Mountain Butterfly thing, the direct references to Japanese people. Uh, it's by Hiroshige, and the work is called Kambara Yoru no Yuki. And I should have written the translation of that down, <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> We talked about riding that line between pop and something else. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like that's what prevents it from being higher for me. Is like it goes in directions you don't expect. Like I think it's a very interesting song, but just listening to it, like just to listen to it, to enjoy it, I don't know if it quite gets to the same level as other because it is like doesn't quite fit into like a box, you know. Ooh, for me, it's a little malformed. It really hits all the spots for me. I don't know how personal I want to get with this. Like. She's like, oh, Pinkerton, like, oh, he, like, is super frustrated and lonely and angry and, like, oh, I feel like that perfectly. But, like, there have been a few experiences in the past where you realize you're falling for someone and it's, like, when you really fall for someone, it's been a long time. It's, like, oh, man, like, this is a lot to take in. He cuts to that really perfectly in the chorus. Like, I'm shaking at your touch. I like you way too much. Yeah. Where you're yeah. just, like, oh, man, I forgot my own feelings about this. And now that these feelings are back, like, I have no idea what to do. His delivery of that line right at the end which i love where the guitars are just going crazy for the one bar and he goes i'm ready let's do it baby and yeah. he, he's <laughs> yeah. kind of whining it he's kind of screaming it and Unhinged, the guitars are just like, like you said someone else is just like sliding up a fretboard <laughs> yeah. and it really i forget which song it is on father john misty's i love you honey bear he sings something like come on let's put a baby in the oven and it's like right as the all the instruments are ramping up to lose they all lose their shit and he's like and it, just the idea of that it's kind of the same feeling of like, no, like, oh, all right, like, I can't stop myself and yeah. here we go, or, which I like a lot. The idea of being in a spot in like a relationship or something that's not quite a relationship where you're not ready to expose your true feelings because you're worried about like how the other person feels or you're afraid to like sort of go to the extent that you might feel because you're worried that it could like, that you could be more into them than they are into you is definitely a... Uh, Something that I feel like everyone has felt. For sure, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just for a bee. sure. <laughs> say it once, I'll say it again. Yes. Uh, he's in his mid-20s, we're all in our early 20s, just like, people, if you want to settle down, then, like, no one wants to talk in their 20s about settling down, but if you want to settle down, you really want to settle down, and you really want to find the right person. It's that whole, like, not wanting to bring it up, because once you bring it up, you can't unsay it, but, like, would yeah. you be the one who wants to settle down? I've, totally. All of those emotional ingredients in that song, they just come together perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Four? I'm sure. I think you said that extremely well. Yeah, I fully agree with that. And we're we're really getting to the to the nitty gritty here. Number four. Oh, this is such a good album. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Okay. So that. So that. Number four. I am personally disappointed that it fell to number four because it is one of my favorites. It is an easy contender for number one on any given day for me. This is across the sea. Ooh. Across the sea. This one here was really, for me, battling for number four. I mm -hmm. ultimately put it at number five, mm -hmm. but a lot of the times this is number four. Even in the past, I guess, it's been even higher than that for me. But for the last while, it's been a little lower than my top three. This, for me, for a long time, it was my number one. Honestly, like I think if you had asked me before I really sat down and made this list, I would have said it was my number one. It's such a good song like this is the most operatic song oh that's far, yes, far. Yes, yes totally i love the way it opens yeah the cool little piano bit yeah and the and the, and the yeah distorted chord like it's just such a such a great intro the lyrics are it's, it's one of the songs like we talked about world has turned and left me here how I sort of felt like that was emblematic of the sound of Weezer and of the Blue Album. I feel like this is emblematic of the sound of Pinkerton. Like, like you said, operatic, like the heavy guitars, but also like 
it can be like delicate at times. The lyrics being like sort of riding that line between like honest and then being too honest. Yeah. They're like creepy moments yeah. in this song for sure. But I feel like, like you said, it, it rides the line really well. The bridge part is so good. Oh, the part where it's like words and dreams and a million screams of how I need a hand in mind to feel. I think that might be one of the most epic parts to any Weezer song. I'm not using that as in like epic win. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, not an epic fail, certainly. Yeah, operatic might be. It's bombastic. Yeah. Like... I couldn't I think, tell if you were joking when you said bombastic <laughs> or not, but... No, I no, think it is. Bombastic. I think this is definitely the most emotional song on the entire album. Yeah, I think this far. is, especially that part, is definitely a strong contender. Yeah. yeah uh, it's, it's something where, like, to me, it's the perfect sort of intertwining of the emotion of the lyrics, the emotion of the vocals, like, singing the lyrics, and the emotion of the instruments, like, really, like, crests at, like, mm, all at the same time and yeah. really, like, hits that moment so hard and so well. Really, you can feel the pain coming through, like, so clearly and, like, yeah. the part, like, the why are you so far away from me? Yeah. Not only within the choruses, the other part near the end where he just kind of like screams it and then it goes, not really screams, I'm trying to think of how it goes kind of, <laughs> but before it goes into the, I could never touch you, I think it would be wrong, Yeah. right at the very end, I think you can really feel it in there. I think this song makes an incredible like album half closer yeah so it's yeah, like side if, one kind yeah of if thing. you were listening to it on a uh, record or the cassette of it this would be the last song before you flipped it mm -hmm. which i think more so back then than now but that's something that a lot of artists really had to keep in mind while putting a record together yeah like, you don't think side, about this kind of structure yeah, of it like as, that. yeah like you really have to think about a side one closer and a side two opener mm -hmm. on top of just an album opener and an album closer with a lot of artists not just today but like in general like there is a bit of a tendency to like front load yeah like all your best stuff at the start and like i get that like like if like you want like your big single like near the start but i feel like the really great albums are where you look in the middle like five and six and it's like these are fantastic songs yeah and that's that's true of i mean we'll get to the sixth song later but that little five six spot is a real treat that's mm -hmm. a huge part to this album mm -hmm. where do you even start with this song like it's so focused and so yeah determined in its look like in its movement forward to me it's like it takes the sort of themes and like ideas that are expressed like throughout the album even like the japanese-ness of it <laughs> yeah like it, it sort of like takes all the themes and it focuses them in like a specific idea, a specific story about a thing that happened. It's a very specific example that sums up all of the themes within its sort of mm -hmm. storytelling. It's definitely the most like autobiographical, like that it's just about the letter that he got and his own emotional reaction to it. Mm -hmm. That chorus is just so perfect. <laughs> yeah. even, even when it's preceded by him thinking about <laughs> she touches herself, he was nailing it all the way through. And like, if you're the reaction you're having through the rest of the album is like, he's been a little creepy. And like, you get to that point, you're kind of really like, oh, he's yeah. really. It's like, yeah, it definitely like just the moments where it's like, it makes you cringe because yeah. like, it's so on it. <laughs> like, it's so, it's like, ooh, too real. <laughs> <laughs> you got too real for a second there. Why are you so far away from me? I need help and you're way across the sea. I could never touch you. I think it would be wrong. I've got your letter and you've got my song. It's just like... <sighs> and like to get personal again, you know, I felt that where I felt very like alone and lonely and isolated at certain points in my life. And kind of through happenstance, you feel an incredible sense of connection with someone who is nowhere near the nation. And... Of domination? Sure. That was... Never mind. I'm so, not going to start talking who, about wrestling again. Someone who's across the <laughs> sea, it's such a weird place to be in, and he just nails all of those feelings yeah. perfectly. The idea of sort of like constructing this narrative for yourself or constructing an idealized version of a person. like Another big Rivers theme of building someone up in his head. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, so we're going to move on to the number three song on the album. Like, I feel like just like looking at the list of songs, just to be clear, I know I knew the list because I compiled it. I'm sure these guys have a rough idea of it because they heard at least each other. I didn't mm-hmm. tell them my list. So far, this has been a little more surprising than the Blue album was hmm, in some ways. Yeah. Well, I, maybe only because you screwed up putting the <laughs> <place. laughs> That's true. And it's funny because it's it's not even as close. The blue album, like the middle the middle group were very, very close together. Whereas here I think it's like there are two very obvious top tracks and then there's a little bit of a middle area and then there's a second bit of a middle area that's like quite a bit far farther apart from like it, it sort of is grouped together mm-hmm. pretty cleanly. Yeah. Which I think is interesting because we've been talking about how hard it is to group this sort of middle four area, but it seems like there is a pretty clear hierarchy that we've managed to assemble. The number three song is Why Bother? This is the poster child for what we've been talking about. Gets in, does its thing, gets out. The intro is like... It is so tight. The intro is like five seconds long. It's just a bass playing one note, and they just launch in. This song here, even though it's a little heavier is uh really kind of the buddy holly or no one Mm. else of this album not so much no one else lyrically kind of just like the formula of it i think exactly like what we've been saying it's short it's catchy like relatable themes to it the why bother round sort of near the end of the song i really enjoy that obviously like the chorus is just like yeah something else i've been talking a lot about uh i've talked a decent amount about brian on some of the tracks i think it's interesting that uh at some points during live shows brian actually sings lead vocals on this and i think it sounds incredible i think he does a really good job of this this song works really well for brian Mm -hmm. would have been interested to see like an actual recorded one with him doing uh lead vocals but you can find some pretty well recorded live recordings of it on youtube i think another interesting thing about this song though is that originally on the hype sticker on the album like on the outer like kind of cellophane the featuring yeah uh so it the outside of it said uh featuring el scorcho the good life and why bother Mm -hmm which I think would have made a better single than Pink Triangle, even though we kind of talked about the shortcomings of it. Mm -hmm. I was going to say there may be a line in there that's a little inappropriate for radio (laughs) play, but then I remembered, oh, it was competing with I'm dumb, she's a lesbian. Yeah, like Which, very, not, not cloaking and itself Elle at all. And show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't think anything was too inappropriate. <laughs> it's true. Just a, just a quick side note about hype stickers. I just bought a copy of the Black Album by Jay-Z. Yeah. And the hype, like the hype thing on it was like featuring what more can I say and change clothes. <laughs> have either of you heard of either of those songs? I mean, like I have because I didn't know that album. That album has... 99 problems on it. Like, let's just let's just start there. It has like dirt off your shoulder. Yeah. Uh, it has some other stuff. But, like <laughs> like two super bizarre choices. Like I don't know where they were coming from with that. I don't know. I don't yeah. know if it, it was new or old. Like it was like a new copy I bought. Like it had the wrap on it, but it said just just the mention of change clothes really made me laugh. <laughs> Another interesting uh, hype sticker story is on the copies of uh, Hurley by Weezer. <laughs> The uh-huh. sticker says, <laughs> including the hit singles, and then lists every single song <laughs> on the album. Nice. Classic Which Weezer. Makes me laugh every time I look at it. <laughs> Hurley is by far the al- the uh, episode I'm looking most forward to doing. Yeah, I think... By far. I feel like the albums that like have that are a little more flawed are going to be more interesting to discuss. I cannot wait for like make believe (laughs) ratitude red Hurley, but But let's save it. (laughs) Why bother? Oh, good point. (laughs) (laughs) It's just perfect in every way. Like the verses are four lines long. (laughs) (laughs) It's like four lines of verse one chorus, verse two, 
chorus, a solo, which is, I think is four bars. Pretty much. Uh, verse three, chorus, and then the chorus twice, doing the little overlapping vocal mm-hmm. thing. And then it's done. It really is the Buddy Holly of this album. It is... Yeah, I really like that comparison. Just lyrically, I love the whole, he's going all in on Why Bother, which I think is just such a great emotion because you know that he's going to do it. Yeah. You maybe do it once or <laughs> twice. I'm like, no, I'm going to cut myself off and I know I'm going to save myself all that hurt. But Falling For You is waiting there in the track list. Like, you know you're going to get feelings no matter what you do to try and mitigate it. Yeah. And like this, I feel, is the perfect Weezer mix of serious and super goofy. Yeah. Like There's some <laughs> funny lines in here. Oh, there's a real good sense of humor in this song. Yeah, and just like the fact that it's so short, like the lyric, I feel like there's no like bad <laughs> like i feel like every weezer song or a lot of weezer songs like there's at least one line where it's like really <laughs> you had yeah, to include yeah. that line but like why bother i feel like it's just the cream of the crop because really like is. there's no room for any bad yeah. stuff in it uh, yeah are we talking about the uh but it's just sexual attraction not something real so i'd rather keep whack i like that line yeah it's good the first time i heard that i was just like wait are they talking <laughs> about jack and all <laughs> and then actually listening to the live performance where brian sings it in 2005 i'm just like oh that's definitely what they're talking about because he changes the lyrics to uh not something real so i better get packing or something <laughs> like that do you know how i knew the very first time that he says whackin because i was sitting in the back seat of a car that you were in the front seat of and you turned around in the seat <laughs> and emphasized whacking whacking maybe we could even get together maybe you could break yeah, my heart like i'm mad yeah, i didn't write that yeah. the tone of it his vocal delivery like maybe you could break my heart next summer it's so playful and so full of heartbreak but just delivered in this tight pure pop rock form. and the yeah. whole line about him talking about like his head like crack it open let Ooh, me out of here yeah. like this song has some great lyrics just that whole idea of like knowing it's gonna be bad in the end but going through with it anyway and like yeah, sometimes you just gotta say, fuck it. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you just gotta say, for sure. <laughs> So like, it's hard to, I wish we could talk more about it, but it's like, it yeah, just, like, like, yeah, there's only so like, much to say because there's only so much in the song. I think, yeah. yeah, we've probably covered more lyrics on this song <laughs> than we have of any other one, just because there's so like few. Like 75% of them. Yeah. Because we said the words, why bother? <laughs> yeah. I think... It's a good time to move on to the number two song. This was my number one song. Oh. It is Tired of Sex. Tired of Sex. Ooh. <laughs> just saying just saying the name of it makes you want to listen to it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the yeah, intro really. is so good. Like, the drums oh gosh, and the synth like... and then the bass. Ki- like, it's such a good intro to an album, especially it's so disorienting and then it like kind of like coalesces but in a way that is very like off kilter like if you went from the blue album to hearing this it would blow your mind more than it already does when you listen to it like i said earlier like this was one of the songs that they uh played while touring the blue album i also like how it goes from a a song with a very distinctive bass line at the end of blue of only in dreams and then you go into this song which has a very distinctive exactly the synth in this song Mm -hmm. is that's what really makes it for me i mean i love the song i put it as my number two Mm -hmm. but there have been definitely points where i've said I've almost said this was my number one. Yeah. But uh, the synth, I just think, is incredible. Like, the same one that's used in uh, I Just Threw Out the Love of My Dreams, which is a great, easily my favorite Weezer B-side. Mm-hmm. It sets the tone of the album a lot more. It starts with that screeching. It starts more messy, disoriented. So you can instantly tell it's nothing like the Blue yeah. album, right? And, like, when it and goes then, in, like, it's structured more like a song than some songs. But yeah. it's also, it's very, like, haphazard and like crazy like you it, it's you don't know where you're at yeah like i was saying like it's nothing like the blue album like musically and then it goes into like i'm tired of having sex like that is nothing like anything <laughs> yeah. off the blue album <laughs> yeah i uh, read somewhere it was on some uh, website and they're just like yeah people were kind of like what when this came out it's like who wants to know about the <laughs> sex life of the guy who sang Buddy Holly, right? Like, Yeah. Blue, I feel like, is a very virginal record, almost. Like, I, I feel mm. closeted up alone yeah. in your room, whereas I feel like this yeah, album like is, only like... only in dreams, like... Yeah. Like, I feel like Blue is about being by yourself and, like, wishing you had someone, and then Pinkerton is like, okay, you have someone, now, now what? what? Like, yeah. it's like, your problems aren't over, like, you're not... 
you're not happy. You're not suddenly like you could happily almost, ever after. Yeah. Like compare that to the rock star status. Now he has it in yeah. Pinkerton, and he does know what to do with it. Yeah, and it's like this. Like this doesn't make things easy. It just changes what the problem is or like what the difficulty is something else that really should be known because we've spent a lot of time i talked about the synth we all kind of talked about the bass line how good that is but like the, the solo, solo in this yeah. is yeah. insane this is one of my favorite weezer guitar solos it's very like there's no rhyme or reason to it and yet like you can hear like you can hear it so perfectly in your head as if it was like a very natural yeah. like melodic kind of solo I think, like, talking about, like, the chorus, too. It's, like, very catchy, I think. Is there even a chorus in this song? Yeah, where he's, like, listing off all the girls' names. I feel like that's, like, a pre-chorus, and then it just... The chorus is him just screaming. Yeah, the chorus is the instrumental break. Oh, this this screams in this song. Or just, yeah. like... It just acts so perfectly as a palate cleanser from Blue. Yeah. If you're listening through, or if you, like, love Blue for two years and then heard Pinkerton, like... Yeah, it's oh, like an like, opening salvo. It's yeah, just, like, just tired of said. Like, this is so different, not only from Blue, but from so many of the other sentiments. It connects to that sentiment that Pinkerton is kind of based on of reaching out for a real, genuine emotional attachment. But just the whole idea of, like, tired of said, like... Rivers, so many of his songs are about, like, oh, that stereotypical 90s nerd. I'm too scared to talk to her, like... Mm-hmm. The other way around, like, no, I know how to talk. I'm getting all these girls. And, like, it's all hollow and it's all meaningless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and... it's not, like, it's not looking for emotional attachment because you have no one. It's, like, you go back to, like, that letter, like, when he talks about the life of a rock star. It's, like, not having attachment because you know too many people. And it's just the perfect turn from Monday night, I'm making this girl. Tuesday night, I'm making this girl. Wednesday night, I'm making this girl. Like, it's so, like, direct and crass. And then he goes, why can't I be making love come true? And it's this perfect reversal where he's like, I'm doing all these, all these, like, I have the rock star dream and I'm completely miserable inside of it. I think an interesting fact about that actually was uh, originally one of the uh, girl's names in there, he put in the name of his girlfriend at the time and she was like, please take my <laughs> name out. <laughs> I can't imagine being Rupert's cool. A, I can't imagine being Rupert's cool with girlfriend, but I can't imagine like being his girlfriend and then he puts out this song yeah. and I'm like, oh, like, <laughs> yeah. this is what's inside your head. Like you're so weird and gross. Like, yeah, yeah. Are there any other songs by many other bands that are they like actually like name the girls? <laughs> <laughs> well, th- not only that, but just that whole sentiment of I guess there's some like rap songs that are a little bit. That's like not, it. but like it's not braggy. Yeah. yeah. At all. Well, the thing is about this too. I can't even remember where I heard this. It was someone else talking about Pinkerton, but uh, they really said like, like the '90s was the first gen or like the first ever decade where it wasn't cool to be a rock star and sleep with a lot of girls. Mm -hmm. And then Rivers comes in and, like, starts talking about it in, like, the least cool way possible. Like Yeah, like, I feel like when you compare it to, like, 80s bands, like, we love to talk about Guns N' Roses on this podcast. (laughs) Yeah, we could not get through an episode. When you compare, like, the veneer and, like, the, the, like, they feel very, like... (laughs) Like, Rocket Queen by Guns N' Roses literally <laughs> recording. <laughs> they like, had sex in the studio, studio and recorded, recorded it. it so. Yeah, like, it feels like... It's a like, very crass thing to do. It's a very, like, you're looking, or, like, you're, like, you're like looking up at them, like, or there's, like, a glass cube that they're, like, yeah. encased in, and, like, you can't, like, yeah touch it. And then you have, like, grunge stuff, and you have this stuff, and, like, very, like, very much more, like, basic, honest, like living the life of a normal person to a certain degree or like being more realistic with how you're talking about the life that you do live. We could do a whole series of episodes yeah. just talking about like rivers and who he is as a person and like what's going on, yeah, yeah. what's going on in his head. Like he's a very, very interesting. Yeah. I would use the word interesting. very like hard to understand kind of person for sure. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. It's yeah. just the perfect... It's, it's just a great it's perfect opener. Yeah, I'm probably going to listen to it after this. Yeah. We have to hit number one. This was not my number one, but it was Tyler's number one. And it was Chaz's number one. It's The Good Life. The Good Life. The Good Life. Oh, and I, Tyler, I feel like you were influenced by Chaz because he loves this song so much. I mean... Which is okay. Yeah, well, I mean, definitely, because that was the one where it's like, oh, you will like this song. And it's like, yeah, okay, like, this is such a great song. But mm-hmm. I mean, I've spent a lot of time these past two months listening to this 
album alone by myself by gathering my own thoughts about it. As close as you can say to objectively, it's, I'm gonna say it's the best Weezer song. It's, <laughs> I like that. It's a pretty perfect pop song. I feel like it beats out songs like Across the Sea and Why Bother because almost every single line in this song is reflecting something different, but it all cuts back to the same emotional state. You know, Why Bother, it's like, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna have feelings for this person. Across the Sea is, I'm feeling this connection to someone who is so far away. And this just paints such a complete and colored picture of what he's feeling. It sounds like, even if it's talking about something that's in the past, like where he actually sounds like happy and confident and like yeah. okay with where he's at. Even when it's just like nostalgia for a different time. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of probably the more like straightforward poppy-ish songs on the record for sure. I would definitely say it's probably the poppiest one. The most mm. like typically structured. Yeah. At least poppy chorus. I mean, definitely the verses are very quirky mm -hmm. to them. I think just kind of like the chords used and like the intro bit and stuff, there's definitely a lot of quirky aspects. Uh, it's kind of a quick disclaimer because I'm going to say a lot of really great things about this song and no bad things about it because uh, since the first time I heard this song, this has consistently been my favorite song of all time <laughs> since then. And we joke a lot about, oh, like, all Weezer songs are the best songs and then everything else can still be good, but never as good as Weezer stuff. But I would say this is definitely my favorite song of all time by far. I just think there's so many incredible parts to it. There's kind of like the uh, verse and then it goes to the pre-chorus, which just teases you and it feels like you're about to go into the chorus. Then no, just uh, it goes back to the intro <laughs> bit again. That comes later. Yeah, it really teases you. And then you're just like, oh, come on, just let me get to the chorus already almost. <laughs> let me and, finish. And then <laughs> as soon as the second pre-chorus hits and it actually builds up and it goes right into the chorus, you're just like, oh, in shock, I feel. But there's so much to say about this. I think it really should have been the lead single off the album. I think things may have played out a lot differently yeah. for them if it was. Because it is a more radio-friendly song than uh, The Good Life. Or El Scorcho. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's equally as radio-friendly <laughs> as The Good Life. Yeah, it's interesting because like when they sort of saw that the album was floundering a little, they rushed out the good life as a single and it didn't really do much yeah but i, I feel like a little, i feel like the damage yeah. was done at that yeah point. it was mm -hmm. too little too late this has my favorite weezer single artwork as well as even like the back cover to this single i think is really cool it's an x-ray of rivers cuomo's leg after he got yeah. like his leg extension surgery i mean i think this is a great song like i, I don't know if i have a ton to say about it but I think it's an awesome song, obviously. I, w I don't begrudge you guys at all for having it as your number one. I just wanted to throw in something I found interesting, like the music video. It, it has this like weird sort of thing where it uses like a bunch of different camera angles yeah. to like compose mm. one sort of like mosaic looking type picture <laughs> on this DVD. Scott Schreiner said that this like sort of the way that they filmed it was so innovative. I've never seen it since. <laughs> <laughs> there is some great commentary on the uh, they're Weezer so, like, video yeah. capture device, especially the commentary by Scott on the stuff that was done before he was in the band. <laughs> it always just makes me laugh. So He's just hard. like their number one fan. <laughs> yeah. Much as you could do an episode or a bunch of episodes about Rivers, like I feel like at some point we need to do like the members of the band has just like an episode. Yeah, talk about their individual side projects as well. Talk about how tall they are. Yeah, we could do that. Much more their, than rivers. Their names. <laughs> oh, yeah. like, oh, this really is the one, like, where do we begin? Uh, for one, that sweet riff. The sweet riff, such an awkward delivery of these two chords, which just becomes iconic in its own right. Just the down, 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 down. Just perfect. Uh, I love Joel. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, love Joel? Uh, Chaz has this recurring theme of they mix it up chorus after chorus. And I feel this song more than others, they bring in instruments just for specific parts. You've got the little finger snapping right at the beginning mm -hmm. to count it in. And right during the, the transition. Guy. Yeah. Check like me like he says, yeah, check me. I love the little chimes or bells or whatever that they bring in for that little yeah. bridge part. I feel like this is the one song for me where Rivers truly, he successfully evokes pity. <laughs> like 
so many other songs he's like oh like oh every I, I no okay i take that back and tired of sex he does it too he's basically asking you oh please feel sorry for me and if you go why <laughs> his answer is different in every song like oh i liked a girl but she's a lesbian it's like, and like so I, much of it it's just like rivers this is your own fault <laughs> like, exactly when he addresses that, that in this yeah. song. When you said that, uh, when you said that, it's the one song where he successfully like gains pity. It made me think of there's there's this Onion headline that's man not technically pathetic and that he fails to elicit pathos. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a good descriptor for Rivers. But in Tired of Sex, he's like, oh, I want you to feel bad for me. Like why? Because I'm sleeping with all these women and I uh, feel so far away from true love. Like oh, okay, as a songwriter. Yes, that's a good reason to be sad. <laughs> For this one, just feeling that you are so far away from the best times in your life. Yeah, yeah. just like, uh, I used to be good and now I'm not good. Yeah, and wanting to go back. Yeah. And it's... just, yeah, and personally, like I've just felt every single line of these uh, verses to a T, so it feels weird to have them like described back to me. It's a very simple idea, but the way it's lyrically expressed is there are a lot of like really funny turns of phrase or like the yeah. way that they like structure the yeah. verse. It's a, just... it's a big pop single. And the first line of the chorus is, I don't want to be an old man anymore. <laughs> yeah. Which is so unlike a pop single, even for the time I feel. And yeah. even for like the alt rock territory that they were going through. But I feel it so perfectly every time. Like he's, just, I don't want to be an old man anymore. Yeah. And also, it should be said, he is not an old man at this point. No. Like, yeah. Not even close. I think it should be, uh, should kind of go into detail here on as to why he's really singing this. Uh, Rivers Cuomo was born with one leg that was shorter than the other leg. So after mm. the success of the Blue Album, when he had a bunch of money and stuff because of that, he got corrective surgery to fix this. But the healing process took a while, so he had to use a cane. And that's where the x-ray on the back of the single came from that I was talking about. So he kind of says, I don't want to be an old man anymore. Like it's been a year or two since I was out on the floor and stuff. Meaning like he can't like do stuff at clubs and stuff because he's got like a cane and stuff, which he addresses in the song as well. Saying like without an old man cane, I'd fall and hit the ground. And the whole thing, like I'm bitter and alone. I think even despite talking about him being like an old man and stuff at the start of the chorus, I think these are some of my favorite chorus lyrics. Mm -hmm. I think, this is one of, if not the most catchy chorus ever, in my personal opinion. Especially the way that the transition into the chorus happens, either from the pre-chorus or kind of the bridge part, where, you know, it goes from that whole chaotic solo that's just an absolute mess, but it still feels like it's got some extent of organization behind it with, like, the rhythm guitar underneath, and then it kind of just settles down almost like the whole coming to terms with stuff mm -hmm. into that really melodic and smooth place where it's got like the xylophone type thing along with the uh, the two different guitars in there. I just think it sounds incredible. And then it just transitions from that kind of into another sort of different pre-chorus where it's like, I want to go back yeah. or whatever. The sort of coda. Speaking of it being operatic, like I feel like a lot of times it'll have like a post bridge sort of part yeah like it'll it'll sort of i feel like the general structure of it is like it feels like i'm gonna go crazy i'm gonna go crazy and then the solo is generally like super crazy and then it sort of goes down again and then it slowly comes back up again mm -hmm. i think that build up is just absolutely just not even the way they build it up with just the basic guitar and the vocals on it but the bass line that's under that too is something that's just incredible i think it's nothing like too technically like advanced or anything but it really like hits the nail on the head there like that's it just adds so much to it i think as well as the baseline for the final chorus they switch it up as weezer likes to do but oh, they uh, love it <laughs> yeah but i just think the whole transition from that almost bridge bit at the end where it's like i want to go back yeah and then it like holds for Stops. a second and then everything and cuts out for that yeah. half second. Yeah. And then it goes right into the chorus. I feel like, I feel like probably because of how long we record for, but like, I feel like by the time we get to like the number one song, we're just like, we can't oh. even like deal with how <laughs> yeah. much we love the song. Yeah, for mm. sure. I could just read all of the, it's one of those <laughs> yeah. songs that I just read all of the lyrics. Uh, just love 
everything I need is denied me. Everything I want is taken away from me. Who have I got to blame? Nobody but me. Which is like, like Chaz was saying, so many of these times, so many of these songs, you're listening to Rivers and going, this is all your fault. And he's like, in this song, he goes, no, yeah, I know. It's all my <laughs> yeah. fault. Well, the weirdest part too, is that this is like the one song where it's not really <laughs> yeah, his fault. True. Like he was born with a <laughs> fucked up leg. Like I love the fact that he comes in the next verse with screw this crap. I've had it. Yeah. It's such a rock I mean, star thing to say, screw this crap. I ain't no Mr. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I listened to this song for the first time in a little bit the other day. And just like, like actually paying attention to it, I was like, oh, right. They say, screw this crap I had (laughs) in this song. Like, I mean, I guess you want to keep the album like fairly PG. (laughs) But this is, he says bitchin' in the song. Yeah, that's, that's true. But But I mean, like, like, you can't. That wasn't a swear back then. (laughs) Yeah, bitchin' isn't really a swear. You, like what what could he have replaced screw this crap with fuck this shit i've had it like I like i feel like that almost like ties into the fact that like it's like i'm not cool like, yeah exactly like, screw this, this is this, this is freaking real. crap yeah <laughs> what the heck <laughs> it's very good <laughs> it kind of shines through on this album but there's like a lot of times where i mean i am especially guilty of this as well where i was saying a lot of weezer songs and kind of the uh, darker moments of Weezer's discography, a lot of them I'm just like, oh, these have some really good, like, really good instrumentation, but some of the words are just like, just shoot me now. Like, and I've heard a lot of people be like, oh, you know, like, Matt Sharp kind of kept that in check, and as soon as he left, it was gone. It's just like, I don't know, there were some really stupid lyrics on Pinkerton too. And there's a lot of stupid lyrics on Matt Sharp's solo stuff. And there's a lot of stupid things that I still love Mm -hmm. that Matt Sharp does on this album. He makes all these stupid noises. Which is yelping. Yeah, which I really think adds to the songs. Is he the one going, I've had it? Yeah, he does some stupid, quirky stuff, but I a lot of that just feels more 90s than stupid, so I think it kind of gets a pass for it there. That's true. Definitely Weezer writing some awkward lyrics before... Uh, before, before their time. Yeah, before, <laughs> before like, say, Make Believe or Red. I think that's as good a stepping stone as any to talk about sort of the critical reception to this album. I sort of alluded yeah. to it a little before how I think this was, like, sort of a turning point of the band, but mm-hmm. came out... Very mixed reviews, trending towards negative. Mm -hmm. People picked on the lyrics. People picked on just sort of it being a juvenile sounding record, which it is to a certain degree. Like, it's honest to a fault is how I would describe it. Like, yes, it is juvenile, but like people, like that's how people are. Like Mm -hmm. people are this childish. Like even if you're like 30 years old, like you're like, there are lots of people (laughs) that are still just like, just have can't keep it together. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. truly. That are just, that are just a mess. I feel like there's this whole thing. I don't know how long this has been going on for where, uh, something, is made public about a celebrity or something like that. Or like, people are like, oh, I cannot believe that's so like, not normal. And that's just like, yeah, but like, kind of everyone does yeah, that, but like, no one ever talks about yeah, it. Like, like, it's like, think of the thing that you're most embarrassed about, like in yeah. your own behavior. And then imagine that like coming out to the public, it's like, yeah, people <laughs> Ooh, would yeah. probably be, people would probably like, I would definitely be ostracized <laughs> from society as well. Yeah. People were sort of slammed the production to a certain degree. I saw one review that was like, it's a good album, but don't listen to any of the lyrics. Like I was saying before, like it's to a certain degree, you can see where they're coming from, but I don't think any criticism really applies to this album that doesn't apply to Blue. Like this, this album was just a little more open and a little more like honest about it. I feel like like a little more less like trying to disguise it, and especially like the fact that the it, on this more than blue, the music matches the lyrical content. Like I feel like blue is like the same level of like sort of dark or like weird or uncomfortable lyricism, but like couched in this like poppy style. Whereas with this, it's more like laid bare almost kind of the more critic angle of that is blue definitely has a wider emotional palette whereas if you are sitting down to listen to pinkerton you better be in the mood for pinkerton that's true it is it is much more like specific and it it, it is sort of like to a certain degree it is like the same song like over and over like the same kind of song yeah even though like it's the same moods and ideas Yeah. yeah it definitely paints with a not as broad a brush that's very true famously 
the Rolling Stone fan poll. Yes. Named it the third worst album uh, of the year. It may have gotten another like similar kind of thing where it was ranked as like one of the worst albums. Yeah, I read somewhere that it was like second worst of the year behind a Bush album or something. <laughs> but yeah, obviously over time it sort of picked up a sort of cult following. Yeah. The one thing that I really want to talk about is maybe I'm trying to sort of like fit a narrative around it a little too much. This album being what it is, as we've talked about, it's very open, it's very honest, it's very raw, it's very emotional. And then to have it be sort of like savage, like it wasn't critically or commercially successful. It pretty much led to Matt Sharp departs the band after the tour. They take a five year hiatus and then come back with Green, which is much closer to blue and even more leans into poppy and super like tightly Mainstream. produced. Yeah. Yeah, I think than blue even. It's reflected in what River says. So this is from 2001. He says it's a hideous record. He says it's a painful mistake. He compares it to like when you get drunk at a party and you admit, and you like say all these things to people. Like oh, you admit yeah. like all your like the like yeah. things that is inside you like kind of pour out and you're like, okay, great. Like I was honest with everyone and then you wake up in the morning and it's like, like, what oh, did I do? I'm God. so like, cause like, because to a certain degree it's like, there are things that you shouldn't expose, like the like the deepest, darkest parts of you. Like there, to a certain degree, like keep it down there. Yeah. What What did you think you would accomplish by airing all of that personal, private, dirty laundry? Yeah. Yeah. Because later, obviously, like once people came around on it, he sort of comes around on it. And so in 2008, he says Pinkerton's great. The songs are super deep, brave, and authentic, which I think is all very true. Seeing this, it's like okay, like I did this. And people hated it, so I'm not going to do this anymore. And I think that this is where Weezer never again gets or even approaches being like super deep. They never really bounced back in the same way. I would agree 100%. And like they made albums I like, they made a lot of very good albums. Maybe Everything Will Be Alright in the End is the closest thing I would call to like a brave record. And I wouldn't say it's, like, an authentic or, like, it's, like, yeah. super real. Even though there's not much of an artifice or not much of a wall between them and, like, their fan base, he never got this real again. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. The thing that always comes to mind thinking about this kind of crisis of identity that Weezer seems to have gone through right after Pinkerton not getting the reception that they wanted was they really went, look, are we a pop band? Are we an alt-rock band? Are we a super personal, autobiographical band? What are we of... an experimental band? Are Which we... they yeah, said we... no. <laughs> There's nothing they ever did that I would call remotely experimental or avant-garde. I would say that at uh, some point, later in the more so middle of their career they had moments where they were definitely trying new things like that but that's yeah they're trying new to a certain degree yeah. but they were they were still very much like in their lane like yeah they, like they it's like el scorcher like they were they were quirky yeah because like i feel like that's a certain like that's part of their identity but they weren't like their music was never experimental in the same way again it never went to the same kind of place again you think you have a specific album not like red, really like i think red, i think red like took there's steps. a couple moments there's definitely moments on red i think i think there's moments on maladroit but i think you know like uh the blue album was kind of that clean cut like pop album mm -hmm. but it was like the clean pop from 94 whereas green was like the clean pop from 2001 right mm -hmm. and then there was kind of pinkerton which was a little more quirky and i'm not gonna compare uh maladroit to pinkerton but i almost think of uh maladroit as like 2002 quirky in mm. some places as opposed to pinkerton being like 96 quirky it became less cool to be like very earnest around yeah. that time like especially like going into like the 2000s like oh yeah being like very honest was not cool at all at that point. Yeah, well, I mean, I feel like there was a lot of like being honest in the 90s. Mm -hmm. I think that was bigger. Maybe it was somewhat on its way out in 96. But I feel like looking back at music, really like the early 90s was like the first time you could like really be honest in music since like the 60s at that point. Because rock had been through this whole revolution of becoming more and more intricate and flashy and showy and it all kind of like 
crested yeah. in the 80s with like concerts with like pillars of fire and people like doing like band. eight yeah. minute shows <laughs> guns and roses yeah and like you know, like people like just Motley get tired Crew. of that yeah, yeah. it was it, it was very i know you love molly crew i'm sorry to have slammed them that way um, I accept your apology <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it is very it is definitely very much a response to like the overpaid like overblown mm-hmm. only brown m&ms kind of like rock star of yeah, that yeah. era but uh, with and Pinkerton, no one better comment and tell me the real story about the M and M's because I already know, <laughs> <laughs> and everyone already knows. So it's just We're stop. All, but with Pinkerton, really, there's kind of two big what ifs. One, what if they had put the Good Life as the main single, and if people had gone, this whole album is worth checking out. Or two, what if kind of the whole thing was either a bit earlier, a bit later, because Weezer crests to you know, this big upheaval in the music industry where radio stops being, you know, the prime arbiter of how songs become popular Mm -hmm. and just big record companies in general making their money by selling records and CDs. And they have survived this whole transition over to the internet where everything is completely different and everyone's finding their own niche. From what I've read, it seems like they thought everyone hated Pinkerton, so they cut themselves off from a lot of the fan base and stuff, and then found only found out later through the internet and stuff that people were really digging Pinkerton. If it had come out a few years later when more people were online and talking about music as it came out, or just like some other way that they could have gotten feedback from people and realized, oh, radio is losing its relevance. Yeah, being and commercially pe- successful isn't always like the decreer of like what's... Yeah, or just, like, Good. it's the first, like, the warning shots of us getting to where we're at now, where someone's favorite album can be some, like, completely unheard of album from 2007 that has, like, three downloads on Bandcamp. Yeah. I agree, but to a certain, like, they're, they're always going to be, like, a mainstream-ish yeah. rock band. And I feel like at that time, like, once you get into, like, the early 2000s, like, you have, like, sort of the rise of indie rock, and I don't think they really fit in that template no, like definitely not. indie rock i feel like at that time was like was like quite clean and pretty polite like i'm thinking of like is this it like mm-hmm. even if it had like a certain edge to it it was like clean and poppy to and then to a certain degree can i get a for sure <laughs> <laughs> for sure <laughs> rolling stone did eventually release a new review where they gave it five stars <laughs> yeah, of course the pitchfork special it goes a lot I with like publications yeah. do that like it's, it's like become... we were wrong it's like just own it yeah <laughs> almost like a politician move and i was gonna bring yeah. this up when you were talking about rivers saying like oh it was an embarrassment and yeah. then going on it's like people he, don't he like it so said, i can't yeah, like it he he just went along with public opinion like that's a really shady thing to do just like it's also a weird interview question like yeah. why would you sit down with someone and be like, hey, what do you think of your other album, three albums back? What do you think of it? Yeah. Which I get with Weezer. Well, it's 2001. But wow. still, like, Life of Pablo, like, someone says, oh, Kanye, what do you think of Weezus? Oh, Jesus. Weezus? <laughs> oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh, shit. Weezus. <laughs> I think that is going to just about do it for this episode. I'm very happy with the things that we talked about. I think we went to some interesting places. Thank you to all the people who listened to our first podcast and this one, especially if you made it all the way through the two hours or so of this talking Pinkerton. I especially want to say thank you to uh, the people that actually had commented and messaged us about it, saying how, like how much they loved it and how excited they were for the next episode. Like, yeah, that's an, like, even though it was only like a handful of people like that's an oh, I mean, unreal like, feel that's the cool yeah, I never, for someone to be like yo that's dope and then for someone else to be like that's dope i can't wait to hear you guys do the next <laughs> one it's like, we do this just because like we like, really it. like <laughs> yeah. yeah we we have fun like sitting in a room for a couple of hours just talking about an album and i think this is very much an extension of conversations not always about weezer but that we were already having we do this because we like it and so to hear that people enjoy listening to it is really cool i just one final thought after all those after everything we've said about pinkerton you've said a bit about not trying to force things into a narrative because especially with a band like weezer it's very easy to be like oh they did this because of that and this because of that but with pinkerton it really it's not inaccurate at all to finish pinkerton go like and weezer was never the same again yeah (laughs) That's, like, a, that's a great way to put it. You know, I love this album so much, warts and all, and it's gotten me through some crazy times recently. And the feeling I get every time I finish... <laughs> uh, 
Chaz is, Chaz is currently drinking it. Chaz is going to keep whacking. And just every time I finish it, it's this band was never, and its main songwriter were never the same again. Yeah, the singularity of it and the uniqueness. And it's like, not only is there not another album like this, like there's not another Weezer album yeah. like this. If you're listening to this on SoundCloud, then you can just scroll down the page and <laughs> see all the stuff I've got. Tyler Um, and we're probably going to get this up on YouTube pretty soon. If sure. we can... Why are you looking at me? No, I'm just talking <laughs> to you. Sounds good. All right. Yeah, we're trying to get up on YouTube soon. We're, we're trying to get published on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. The thing, if assume... anyone could tell us how to get published <laughs> on YouTube. Oh, I Please. think... Um, well, okay. Please it's going to be a hassle because like, we have to fly to Japan and then we have to, take it, we have to go to the suicide forest <laughs> <laughs> and shoot a dead body and then we can go on YouTube. All right. After we do that... I think that's how you get off YouTube. <laughs> how you get off on YouTube. Someone. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Someone please tell me how to upload videos to YouTube. No, just as soon as we find a good uh, this is visual. Our, this is how we Google things. <laughs> we just say it in our Make podcast, podcast. and hope someone comments it. Someone please tell me how to refuel my car. Uh <laughs> That's the best thing you can affect. <laughs> it's like, I'm stuck. <laughs> oh, I just want to plug quickly. Uh, I saw two movies on Tuesday by myself. Oh, no, Thursday. Uh, Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle. <laughs> <laughs> Very entertaining flick. Uh, Jack Black kills it, as usual. You're plugging Jumanji? I'm- I'm playing Jumanji colon, Welcome to the Jungle. Uh, Jack Black kills it. Dwayne Johnson, as usual. Kevin Hart. I'm on the fence about him. I enjoyed him in this flick. Yeah. 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 That was my Kevin Hart. <laughs> uh, and then I also saw I saw two movies back to back by myself on What's Thursday. What's going on? Did you pay for both of them or just stay in the theater after the first one? <laughs> I paid for both of them because it was a reserved seating and I was uh, sketched right. about it. Yeah. But uh, I also saw Molly's Game. Great flick. Would love to see Jessica Chastain get an Oscar nom. So if anyone from the Academy is listening, <laughs> if nominations are still open, please send that in. Please. Uh, low key, Idris Elba could get a Best Supporting Actor nom. I don't think he will. It's a it's a wide field. He, his role isn't very prominent, but he's great in that film. He's okay. a supporting. Eh? Uh, that's other than that. Yeah, go see those films. I really enjoyed them both. Uh, I will come back with my review of The Post. Next week, hopefully. <laughs> do, do you guys like vodka? I'm going to plug Tito's Vodka. Okay. It's, it's very handmade. Nice, yeah. What does that mean? Just handmade? Yeah. Uh, like the Handmaid's Tale? Yes. <laughs> Those girls in the red dresses make it. Vote for it on Hulu. What am I talking about? <laughs> That's going to do it for this episode of In the Garage. For Chaz and Tyler, this is Chris signing off. Do, 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 do.